Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to Career Cushion, where we connect professions to the people. Our guest for today is Samya Kantrana. He is currently pursuing his MTech from IIC Bangalore. He has completed his B.Tech from IIT Kharagpur, and after his MTech, he'll be joining Texas Instruments. Congratulations on TI. Yeah, thank you, Pranati, and thanks for introducing me and welcoming me to your channel. It's our pleasure, and thanks for joining us today. Can you give us a brief introduction about yourself uh, from IIT Kharagpur to TI? Yeah, sure. So back in 2016, I joined IIT Kharagpur uh, to pursue B.Tech in Electrical Engineering, and then uh, that time I was a pretty introvert person first of all, and uh, all that I cared about was that I should uh, study well and get good grades. That's it. I didn't have much other things to think of. So uh, the, all my B Tech was mostly focused on that. I was either studying or uh, sitting in my room playing games. So that's how the first uh, three years of my B Tech went. And uh, then I, in my third year, I did my internship at Bajaj Auto. Uh, it was uh, a good learn, good learning experience from my side. But then I didn't perform that well because it was a huge jump for me. Uh, being in the academics and all throughout my life and my first corporate stint uh, that was so i didn't do that well uh, that time but then i had several lessons to take so which helped me further in my life and then after completing my btech i joined uh, garden dish shipbuilders and engineers limited in calcutta where i worked for about a year or so and then uh, after that i joined uh, masters in electronic systems engineering at isc back in 2021 and then uh, recently last year october i got placed in uh, texas instruments as an analog engineer yeah over so to nice. you so good so good uh, which stream have you chosen in btech and uh, when have you started your gate preparation uh, yeah so i chose electrical engineering in my btech as i said and regarding gate preparation i started back in my second year itself because uh, what i saw in kharagpur is that uh, maximum of my peers and seniors were uh, into the non core domains because uh, it's after all it's demand and supply so the m number of jobs in those domains were higher so almost uh, i mean if not 80, 80, 80 and 85 80 to 85% of the batch was engaged in uh, those streams so i didn't find uh, many seniors to discuss with regarding my career options and all so that time uh, in the second year itself i felt that uh, gate can be a good option to pursue and uh, i had the chance to study from the uh, best professors of the country i mean uh, many of those professors have wonderful informative courses on nptel and uh, i learned from them sitting in the classroom so that was an advantage for me so right from second year i started my gate preparation from the courses that were being taught to me in the semester along with that i used to study from standard books so second and third year that's how it went by at the start of fourth year uh, in july august that time i started solving gate previous years questions and then uh, test series and uh, i wrote gate using that and i got a good enough rank okay nice nice so uh, any other resources uh, apart from your coursework uh, you have used for the preparation any books or any particular training institute uh, actually, as I said, I was practicing test series, uh, so I took help of ACE Academy test series because I find that they were uh, quite, I mean, the ACE test series had quite a lot of difficult problems and uh, sometimes uh, difficult problems train you for situations which are little bit simpler than that. So I felt that it was a good training for me. So I used ACE Academy's uh, test series and i use several standard books for my uh, respective courses like for example network theory uh, van valkenberg is a very well known book then for power electronics we have netmog on this these are very uh, well known books so i used uh, standard books like that okay got it got it uh, so you have given gate in 2020 and 2021 as well right so what changes yeah. have you made in your preparation from 2020 to 2021, which helped you to get A27 in 2021? Uh, yeah, so uh, in 2020, I got a rank, I think 99 or so. So already I had my uh, major part of my preparation sorted out. 
so i was not that much serious about attempting gate in 2021 honestly speaking i filled up the form on the last extended last day of application so uh, because uh, what i before that what i was thinking is i already have a decent enough score to get uh, admission in a uh, my desired branch and uh, honestly speaking in september october of 2020 i didn't figure out which branch i yet wanted to that time i was confused between two main branches one was power engineering and i mean power electronics power systems then related fields and another was this vlsi so i hadn't figured those things out yet but uh, what i saw is uh, that score was decent enough to get me admission into iisc or some other iits so preparation wise i didn't have to do much but then one thing that i did is uh, uh, right from september onwards i used to give 20 to 30 minutes every day where i used to solve those topic wise test series of as and uh, what i started with is the topics that i missed out in 2020 for example uh, there were some subjects like signal systems and analog electronics where i made silly mistakes so after the 2020 results came out i sat with an excel sheet and uh, tallied that uh, this subject had this much marks this much marks i got and what i missed why i missed so i tried to fill up those gaps in 2021 uh, during that one year of uh, preparation and uh, yeah i worked on improving my accuracy as well because first time i wrote get i lost 15 marks because of wrong attempt but then next time i uh, in get it reduced to seven or so so that that was something i worked on and uh, another thing was that because already i had a good score so i was relatively free in my mind i didn't have much pressure so I could uh, relax and uh, I felt that that helped me to do better. True, true. I didn't have that exam nervousness in 2021. Nice. And also that Excel sheet analyzing everything was such a good thing. Uh, yeah, exactly. I know what are my strong points, what are my weak points, so I could proceed accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, how have you managed your preparation with college in 2020 and with job in 2021? Uh, uh, frankly speaking, it was not that difficult for me because I'll tell you honestly, uh, in uh, uh, for us, if somebody from electrical or electronics is preparing for gate, the first year of engineering, you would be studying maths. Second year of engineering, you would be studying signal systems and network theory, electromagnetics and analog electronics. The third year of engineering, if he's an EC person, you would study, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, communication systems digital electronics and uh, something else and for electrical it is power systems power electronics uh, and i don't remember uh, the other subject so if uh, during the semester itself if somebody studies from nptl or some standard books it will not be a problem why majorly the problem arises uh, with us is that uh, in many colleges we see that uh, the exam papers are not that difficult so people are used to studying for the in the last week or the last night and getting good marks. So if we get used to that, then the problem comes when uh, somebody starts preparing for getting the third year itself. So because I was doing it alongside my semester, I didn't have much trouble that time. With job, yes, it was a little difficult, but I won't say it was very difficult because my job was predominantly a shift-based one. So I used to be on duty from 8.30 in the morning to 5 in the evening. If I used to uh, reach home at 6, 6.30, I would get fresh. And then after that, I made it a point to devote at least five days a week for a topic-wise test and one day for analyzing those mistakes uh, because uh, that was crucial. If I kept covering syllabus after uh, syllabus, and then I didn't analyze my mistakes and work on them. It would not have made sense. Hmm. So I spent a major amount of time on practice and some uh, amount of time for correcting those mistakes. And uh, that uh, that turned out to be enough, luckily. Great, great. Uh, that's so amazing. Uh, so if I ask you, uh, if you will start your preparation right now, uh, what mistakes do you think you will uh, avoid or what changes do you do in your preparation strategy? or do you keep it as it is? Um, mostly I will try to keep it as it is, but then there are two, three things that I would like to improve on. One thing may be the consistency because uh, many times what happens is we get busy in uh, several other things. Maybe sometimes there is uh, extra work pressure, this, that. But uh, 
being consistent it doesn't mean that every day i have to solve uh, 10 problems or 15 problems if some day i cannot get time to solve 15 problems maybe i would solve one problem a complete zero is always a big uh, difficulty because whenever we try to start something some exam preparation or maybe starting to learn some new skill the initial phase the initial 3 4 weeks it is a very difficult because we have that resistance of learning something new it is inherent so that can, time should be spent to make sure that we can be consistent and disciplined discipline is essential i mean what i feel is discipline is not punishment it helps us to be better and get comfortable in uh, doing new things so that is something that i would correct and the second thing is uh, to improve on my patience because i have done it but still i feel that there is a lot to be done because many a times uh, we get, do mistakes like we don't read the question properly we are sometimes reading in between the lines or assuming something which is not there so silly mistakes happen because of that that is one thing second thing is like for example in gate uh, exam we have an mark for review option so anybody who should give gate, who is giving gate he should utilize that option uh, quite uh, judiciously because sometimes what happens is there is a question with a long calculation and there is a possibility that uh, one might have made a mistake so we should mark those questions of re on review and spend time at the end so that uh, around uh, 15 to 20 minutes if i have left at the end we can spend that time on uh, some seven eight questions to uh, see through if they, i made the calculations correctly or not so mainly these are the three fronts that i would consider improving if i have to write get again <laughs> Got it, got it. Uh, and discipline is one of the most important things to achieve great exactly. things. Uh, can you tell us what are, what are all the options someone will have after giving GATE, apart from PSU, MTech? Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, predominantly people write GATE for PSU and MTech itself, but then uh, there are several other options available as well. One thing is uh, there are uh, several institutes like I I, I mean uh, even in IISC then we, we have Niti Mumbai which offer MD admissions based on GET score as well, mm -hmm. and uh, along with that we have a uh, option for pursuing MS from uh, NTU and NUS in Singapore they also accept GET scores. Uh, there might be some other abroad universities which have, uh, take GET score for admissions. I am not that much aware about them. Mm -hmm. And also there is uh, one more thing that many people are apprehensive of or many people might not be aware. Uh, several IITs and IASC also, they have an MTech research or an MS option. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, different from a normal MTech and that MTech research is that uh, in an MTech research, uh, you get to choose what research area you want to work upon. So for example, if I chose wanted to work on analog and I took admission in MTech coursework, I might not have that much focus on my research work. I have a lot of courses to complete and my project work could be mostly of one year or so. But in MTech research, the number of courses are less. We can take more focused courses uh, re relevant to our research area and spend more time on the research and be more fruitful on that. Now, generally, the gate cutoffs for those uh, ad uh, admission programs are a little bit on the lower side. What matters there is your subject knowledge, your subject interest, and your interview performance. So that is also one a very important uh, opportunity that's available through GATE. Got it, got it. Uh, so mostly it will be uh, focused on the research. Yeah, exactly. So suppose uh, I want to do an MS research in IIT Bombay in the field of analog VLSI design. So there may be some professors who are working in this field will interview me and uh, they generally what they do is they uh, check basic math aptitude skills how good you are in math because uh, re be it research or engineering math is really the foundation you cannot just do without that so maths foundations along with that the subject knowledge and especially the intuition there i mean even in uh, the industry interviews i have seen the uh, the interviewers are generally not bothered about the final answer they are bothered about how we approach the problem, how we understand and conceive things. So those things matter quite a lot there, other than the gate score. Got it, got it. Uh, so how was your interview experience at IISC Bangalore? 
uh, actually i didn't have an interview at isc bangalore because at our times i mean uh, we had to admission during covid so in 2020 and 21 there was no interview mm -hmm. at okay. isc okay okay uh, so uh, after 2020 you joined psu so can you share us about your psu interview experiences and what all rounds were there uh, yeah so in uh, the, my psu uh, job interview i had first there was a screening written test mm -hmm. it was based on uh, qu questions from my t aptitude and technical domains uh, it was of the level of I would call like uh, those AEJ level exams that RRB, SSC conduct and as well as GATE, it was a hybrid of that. Mm -hmm. After that, there was a technical interview which comprised of questions related to my uh, courses, I mean my core courses like power electronics, control systems, network theory, all that. And uh, I was also asked upon the work that I did in, during my internship. Then I was also asked on my hobbies and my interests and all that. Got and it. there was a HR interview that was mingled along with the technical itself. There was no separate HR interview that why would I like to join and all that. Okay, okay. Uh, so apart from GET, there is one more uh, written screening test. Uh, yeah, actually it was not through GET. I got that job through my campus placement. So there was no GATE score involved in that. Oh, okay, okay. Um... So people have this idea that PSUs offer many perks. Uh, what are the perks offered and average salary for someone who joins PSU through GET? Uh, actually, average salary in PSUs may vary from uh, different PSU to PSU. For example, there are uh, PSUs are in different grades, Maharatna, Navratna, and Miniratna. So maybe uh, the fresher who is joining uh, Navaratna or Maharatna PSU, he will be expecting a basic pay of somewhere around 50,000 to 60, or 60,000. And there might be additional perks. And along with that, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, many of them have hospital facilities. Then uh, some of them offer accommodations as well. And uh, then there are several other things like uh, more I mean, telephone reimbursements and furniture reimbursements and all that. Mm -hmm. So the gross salary can somewhere go to 88 to 90,000, depending on uh, the PSU where the person is joining. Some PSUs might recruit at a basic pay of 40,000. In that case, the salary would be somewhere around 70, 71, like that. Okay, okay, got it. Uh, so can you tell what all companies uh, comes under uh, Navaratna and uh, different other two categories and what all ranks someone should get, what all range someone should get to get into those? Yeah, so the mostly the PSUs that recruit through GATE are NTPC, Power Grid, IOCL, ONGC. I mean, these are the four major recruiters that I have seen. There are several others as well like HAL, HPCL and all that. So mostly these uh, these PSUs fall in the Maharatna, Navaratna categories. I'm uh, not sure of the exact segregation. Okay. Uh, and uh, for uh, selection from gate, I mean, if somebody is from electrical engineering background, then I would say rank of under 150 uh, for general is required to get selected into these companies. Okay, okay, got it. Uh, what is your role at Garden Ridge Shipbuilders and Engineers Limited? And can you tell us about your work and uh, your day-to-day -day tasks with simple example? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, in uh, Garden Ridge, I was uh, an assistant manager in the design, uh, design office. So my work was to review the drawings for several systems submitted by the OEM. So for example, there used to be several systems in the ship. Some were designed in-house and some were like uh, offloaded to OEM. So basically we used to float the specifications. OEMs would come up with their offers. We had to sit and compare the offers and evaluate them technically. After that, uh, all the commercial things would be done by other people. And then once the OEM who will supply the system is selected, they would have to supply their technical specifications and drawings from their side. Our work was to review them and ensure that they were compliant as per the naval standards and uh, approve them from our side. Also, there were uh, uh, installation uh, diagrams and interconnection diagrams that we had to make so that the uh, uh, people would be installing the system uh, on board the ship. They would have an idea of which equipment to be placed where, how are the interconnection cables to be routed. So we had to make those diagrams as well. So predominantly, that was uh, my task there. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Uh, 
so what factors have you considered before joining PSU and uh, for living for MTech? So in PSU, I had a good enough salary. The work was also okay. It was I was uh, not uh, I would say I was not dissatisfied with that. But then what I felt is I wanted to do something more in the area that I had studied uh, during my engineering. So I liked subjects uh, like I, I mean by the time I graduated, I liked analog electronics and power electronics and all that. So I wanted to do something more in that field. So, which I didn't get much in my job. So, there predominantly my role was to understand and uh, make comments on others' designs. I would not get opportunity to design things myself. So, I thought doing a master's in power, maybe in power electronics or in VLSI field would be a better option for me. So, after a year of experience, uh, I uh, left and I joined uh, master's. I could have joined masters right after graduation, but then I needed uh, a time. I mean, a break from academics due to several reasons. I'll tell you one such reason. So when I did my bachelor's, I was very weak in uh, programming. Now, as you might be aware in the industry, uh, you need programming uh, in day to day uh, work. There, there are several tasks that need to be automated. You might need uh, several to write several programs for that. So uh, programming knowledge has become an essential uh, skill that every engineer should have who is going to the industry. So I was weak in that. And during the four years of college, I could not muster time uh, to overcome that. And also one more thing that I had is uh, I used to go a lot by first impression. In my first impression, if I didn't like a subject, I lost a little interest in that. But now these things, uh, once I am in a professional place, I can't do these things. So that one, one and a half years of my life, I used to rectify those things. I learned programming, uh, so the, which was uh, which helped me quite a lot during my masters as well. And also these uh, soft skills like uh, how to communicate in a in a professional way, how to uh, speak in a public platform or during a presentation. So these skills I lacked and I felt that I, instead of joining MTech uh, just after graduation, I should take some time off to learn those things. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's it. I uh, did these things and then I uh, joined Masters. I must say you are well aware of your strengths and weaknesses and you are so much focused and you know how to improve your weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have seen several people uh, amongst my co colleagues from whom I draw inspiration. I mean, I have seen them, how they have improved, seeing that I can also try and improve several things. Because uh, at the end of the day, the day I stop improving, everything stagnates. But I don't want that to reach that stagnation so early. So yeah, I feel that uh, trying to improve myself will give me more opportunities and also will make my mind work and make uh, me gen myself generate better ideas as well. True. So true. yeah. Uh, so how is MTech different from BTech? Uh, is MTech more tiresome and exhausting? Uh, so I would say somewhat yes, because in BTEC what we do is we learn uh, things at a very shallow depth, but the breadth that we have to cover is large. In MTech we need to narrow down our area of focus and we have to go deeper in that. So at times it might be difficult. You uh, Some people definitely feel like giving up, but then the people who complete masters, they have mastered that art of not giving up. That is for sure. During the research, during courses, during doing assignments, several times we come across the thought that why I am doing this? I could have better not come here. But then, trust me, if you can curb these feelings and then uh, do whatever tasks you have been assigned now, you will definitely feel that, yeah, I have overcome this. I can do even better things. So these uh, mental, uh, I mean, I would say this uh, mindset shifts do happen a lot in MTech and that is required if you want to reach greater heights in your life. So it is indeed difficult. So for example, I would tell about my research project. So when we started, we were clueless. We didn't have a clue about what we have to do, how we have to do. But then because uh, we didn't give up, we stayed stuck uh, trying to solve the problem, trying to attack it in different ways. So after uh, we stayed stuck for a, a big amount of time, we saw that, yeah, we are getting results. 
that's how life is we don't always uh, get x amount of effort x amount of results you might have to give 10x amount of effort for a long period of time and then the next marginal x amount of effort will give you 100x results you never know so these things mtech does teach you and it is uh, exhausting at times but it is i personally feel it is worth it okay okay uh, i completely agree on it uh, sticking and not giving up yeah uh, so what is your job profile in ti uh, and what is the job profile of an analog engineer and what do you do as an analog engineer okay so i mean uh, with this uh, this question i would also like to highlight other things as well like uh, what are uh, what do analog engineers do what are the different job profiles what is the comparison i mean what is the difference between analog and digital engineers so I'll just present my slides you let me know if it is visible i would uh, tell you about uh, what are the different subdomains in vlsi then uh, what is the difference between analog and digital vlsi what all skills are required in analog mm -hmm. uh, and all that yeah. so basically there are two different domains uh, in vlsi one is in analog and what you know, one is digital mm -hmm. so in analog what uh, analog engineers do is they design uh, the analog circuits which are required for signal acquisition and uh, the processing so for example the main, there are many real life signals i mean almost all real life uh, signals that we need to acquire and process they are analog signals hmm. so for example i would uh, give you an example of an ecg an ecg uh, is used to capture some microvolts level signal from your heart so it requires a good amount of analog signal acquisition and uh, processing to capture an ecg accurately so that involves design of several analog circuits like amplifiers band gap voltage references then you also need uh, power management circuits like low drop or regulators uh, dc to dc converters then of course uh, as uh, digital signal processing is uh, quite fast convenient and that's the norm nowadays uh, for uh, doing complex signal processing tasks we need data conversion as well so analog design engineers also design uh, data converters like adcs and dacs also the standard cells uh, logic gates that are used in digital design they are also designed by analog engineers then uh, memory circuits uh, all the ssd nand flash memories that you get in the market uh, predominantly a lot of analog design goes into that along with that we have circuits like pls and oscillators that go in your uh, processor clocks the clock design and distribution uh, networks that uh, the modern processors have and also the several rf circuits uh, in the 4g 5g space like uh, power amplifiers low noise amplifiers mixers and all which are used to do the analog uh, communication like uh, i mean uh, amplitude modulation frequency modulation so all those circuits are designed by analog engineers Mm -hmm. and then the digital engineers what they design processors uh, like your intel i5 amd ryzen and all that then microcontrollers like uh, several companies have their microcontrollers like ti nxp st microelectronics and all then network flow processors which are used in those networking switches and routers predominantly cisco juniper networks these companies do that then the communication interfaces that analog to digital chips have so for example you might be having a spo2 sensor which sends out digital data so that uh, you have the analog data acquisition and data conversion inside and also you for giving out the digital data to your uh, system you have interfaces like spi uart i2c so these are several things which are designed by digital engineers uh, i may have might have missed out some things but this is a broad idea of what the uh, designs that are done in the respective domains mm -hmm. so we in the respective domains we have design engineers ver uh, verification engineers then testing and validation engineers who have their own different jobs got it mm -hmm. uh, yeah in so in digital uh, uh, design flow predominantly uh, as you see uh, this uh, modern day processors and microcontrollers have millions of uh, transistors in them if not billions so uh, nobody does a gate level design uh, by uh, schematic capture or all that 
so what uh, essentially we do if we want to uh, design a digital chip we first uh, design the architecture and then the functional specifications are defined then we do the register transfer level design where we model the behavior of the system at a register to register data flow level uh, using the hardware description languages like verilog vhdl system verilog and then uh, we do the verification of those rtl codes to check if uh, there are unintended test cases where the system might fail and all this is predominantly done using system verilog and the system c and then we have pre layout simulation i mean uh, i would say pre synthesis simulation before uh, we go to the back end design we first check uh, if the rtl design is uh, working uh, as per the requirements or not then we have to do a dft which is called design for testability so we make sure that once the chip is designed there are no uh, bugs like for example there we might be missing several bugs which are not captured at the rtl level so one particular net of a ga uh, gate can be stuck to the vdd rail of the chip or may be stuck to the ground level uh, ground line of the chip so these things cannot be captured at the rtl level so to capture these things at the later stage of the design we need dft as well then uh, we have synthesis where this rtl code and the uh, gate level circuit is mapped to the standard cells uh, available in the design kit so for example i recently saw the news that intel came up with a 1.8 nanometer process so depending upon the process uh, that the company is using you might have a stand you will have a standard set of cells which will be used for the design then we do a logical equivalence check that the circuit that i have uh, designed from the standard cells is it uh, does it have a one to one correspondence with my rtl or not Mm -hmm. then once that is passed we have the floor planning we allot the area to the chip we place the power lines and then we place the our logic cells that we have synthesized then we uh, also we have to do clock routing and then signal lines routing so that timing checks are also met yeah i missed a very important part here that is the static timing analysis so yeah i can add it Yeah. and then we have to check the layout uh, layout versus schematic because uh, the schematic of a circuit uh, when we deal with the schematic we miss out several parasitic effects which might uh, hamper the performance of the circuit so once it is laid out fully after placement routing timing checks are all done optimizations are all done we need to do an lvs check as well and then we need to run a drc check as well so that uh, the the fabrication will not be a problem so every foundry and process kit comes with a set of design rules so that the uh, during fabrication we get maximum to maximum yield so after all this is done we have a post layout simulation as well once that is passed we proceed to the gds stream out now this gds is used by the foundries to design the set of masks and all that they need to manufacture the chip mm -hmm. Now moving to the analog ASIC flow. Now uh, analog circuits typically contain a few tens and hundreds of uh, transistors, mm -hmm. and uh, in digital we are mainly concerned about zero and one, the setup and hold times, all such things. But in analog, the quality of waveforms that we are getting, or the rise time, the settling time, the overshoots, all these matter. so uh, there is as of now there is not that level of uh, verification automation that is there in digital so uh, what i have heard from industry people is that analog uh, design verification is more challenging because of all these issues mm -hmm. but in analog circuits uh, because they have lesser transistors they are designed at a transistor level so uh, uh, for example a typical analog system might contain a op amp Uh, and a voltage reference and an ldo and maybe a oscillator now all these blocks will be designed individually by different uh, people uh, depending upon their individual specifications they will be laid out manually and then the entire system on chip uh, will be uh, uh, i mean will be assembled and then verified and then sent for tape out so the measured major steps here are design and then verification and pre layout simulation what we call as schematic level simulation then once the layout is done we have to do an lvs and uh, drc checks these are common with the digital uh, flow as well because uh, the frequency response and then as i said the rise time over uh, overshoot settling time all those things depend on the 
uh, actual parasitics that are uh, obtained after the layout so all these things should be taken care before uh, freezing the specifications and sending the chip out for fabrication and then we finally do a post layout simulation and then after that the gds stream out is done and the chip is sent to the foundry now coming to the skills that uh, somebody requires to uh, get a job in analog domain uh, any engineer who is a fresh graduate uh, be it from bachelor's or master's so interview is predominantly on these things i'm coming into more detail but uh, as a fresher one may be placed into design validation testing any of the different domains that are available in analog so any analog interview that will definitely start with first order rc and rl circuits mostly rc circuits so the interviewers expect us to intuitively analyze the step responses ramp responses impulse response and then the square wave responses of these rc circuits without going into the laplace transforms or the differential equation solving now why that is required is uh, in a big analog circuits we have to get some intuitive analysis in order to understand how the circuit is behaving so many a times we need to identify the r's and the c's that are there in the circuit which contributes to the time domain and the frequency response of the circuit so the intuitive analysis of rc circuits is very much important in that case mm -hmm. then we also require uh, the analysis of circuits to dependent sources like uh, you you would say the basics uh, coming before the, the small signal analysis that we do when we analyze the mosfet amplifiers bjt amplifiers and all that and then uh, analysis of circuits involving diodes and op amp circuits positive feedback negative feedback and all that then comes the mosfet circuits uh, knowledge that uh, we have from gate and then we need, uh, there is some things which are not there in gate we need to learn from nptl or uh, several other standard books available so we need to learn about single stage amplifiers like common source common drain what are the common topologies available then cap codes uh, cascade all these uh, topologies as well then the current pairs and differential amplifiers all these things then for uh, masters because uh, when uh, sometimes you are designing a circuit you might want two transistors to be identical but as you might know two same things i mean two similar things are never identical they have some degrees of mismatch depending upon the accuracy of the fabrication process so how to make your design tolerant to mismatch is a big topic in analog design mm -hmm. so student master uh, master students who aspire to be analog engineer how, how to analyze the effect of mismatches in an analog circuit and then the last uh, but not the least uh, we need to have the program the decent programming knowledge as well in in c or python i mean python has nowadays become a very common thing if you go to linkedin and browse job description for uh, digital and analog engineers you will and uh, 80 to 90 percent of the job description you will find python listed there so it is very popular very useful and is very much required also and then uh, there are some common things that uh, every domain requires that you should love the subject and then you should have the eagerness to learn more and all that hmm. so yeah that is there hmm. And uh, regarding how to prepare for uh, analog in details, uh, like wh where all, uh, what all sources to refer for studying the individual topics that I listed, I have some detailed slides on that. I'll share it to you with you so that you can share in the video description yeah. so that others can refer as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I should say this is a very elaborated explanation and you have covered so many questions like the difference between analog and design flow and uh, how someone can improvise their skills or what skills someone should learn to become an analog yeah. engineer and uh, resources also you have shared. Uh, and uh, can you tell uh, what tool someone uh, will use for analog design or in analog domain? Do you use any particular uh, tools? so this website offers you a lot of tools for uh, analog as well as digital uh, vlsi design mm -hmm. that one can uh, use in order to learn the skills and in case one has access to paid softwares offered by companies like cadence and synopsis and mentor graphics in their in university or in case they are joining some trading institute they can follow that as well that is good 
but in case they are not available uh, you can resort to this uh, open source tools as well how was your interview process in the ti and what are all the steps involved any written test and how many rounds were there and what questions were asked yeah so i had a written test at first uh, that comprised analog uh, circuit knowledge and then aptitude then from the written test we are shortlisted and then i had an online interview where i was initially asked a question on op- an op amp circuit with some feedback wrapped around it involving a current source and a diode then i was asked question on rc circuit uh, step response square wave response so i was given a simple r and a c circuit uh, and then uh, initially i was given a step uh, and i was asked to plot the output and then uh, through the other terminal of the capacitor which was initially at ground i was asked to apply another step and then show how the output would change mm-hmm. then uh, i had expressed my interest in power electronics as well so i was asked to explain the uh, sur- uh, explain and draw the circuit of a buck converter and then also i was asked to intuitively explain the transient re- analysis of a buck converter like once you st- turn on the converter how does the output voltage builds up how is the transient uh, inductor current look like how yeah I mean, that's it okay okay you have uh, you have how many rounds of interviews uh this time actually we had one round of interview but uh, dep- it may depend on college to college or uh, depends on panel as well mm-hmm. sometimes i mean some of our seniors had two rounds of interview as well but for us it was only one round okay what will be the average salary in this domain Uh, so if i consider the several product based companies in this field uh, the ctc might range anywhere from 10 to 40 lpa depends on the company and the role mm-hmm. and uh, there are several other factors that is not in our hand and neither i am much aware about that so yeah uh, it may range anywhere in uh, between 10 to 40 it all depends got it got it uh, so uh, how can someone find opportunities in this domain and any suggestions for students from type 2 and type 3 colleges uh, yeah so and uh, there are recently there have been few initiatives coming up like uh, ti has come up with an opportunity for the, all students all over india mm-hmm. uh, that people doing uh, NP, some nptel courses for example uh, the basic network theory Uh, analog circuits analog ic design and advanced courses like tll power management ics people who complete those courses and uh, get uh, top 1 percentile score will be invited for interviews recently ti also came up with a ti fit challenge which was an all india open recruitment mm-hmm. uh, but i hope uh, the several other companies also come up with such things but other than that if i uh, say about uh, what uh, in the open field what other opportunities are available for tier 2 and tier 3 colleges so i mean sadly in india it is a reality that uh, students are still judged on basis of their college degrees i'll tell you one funny story i mean back when i graduated before doing masters i tried applying to several semiconductor companies uh, via their uh, web portal or through referrals but my cv was not shortlisted so uh, in an open field it is difficult so one way can be to uh, clear gate and then go for a masters in a good iit or an nit or the good triple its that are there in india or what uh, one uh, more option that can be is like if, uh, somebody can join the vlsi coaching institutes that are offering training Uh, in uh, design verification layout and all that uh, they also offer placement assistant but i would i like to highlight one important point in the second thing so what uh, this uh, the training centers focus more on is like the hands on act part like uh, you know how to design the circuit then how do you learn to use the software in order to verify your design how to understand that your uh, design is correct how do you rectify the mistakes and then finally arrive at the gds which can be used for fabrication mm-hmm. but uh, some things like uh, how to, uh, the basic knowledge of uh, the subjects the intuition all these things are not covered there i mean there is not much time in a 3 to 4 months course uh, in vlsi design that is offered by their coaching institutes it is difficult even i, I saw on linkedin uh, one coaching institute posted this problem as well that their students were rejected by some companies because 
they even though they had done uh, industry grade layouts in memory design and uh, bgrs and data converters because their basic uh, knowledge in those fields are missing so if somebody wants to go through that route to coaching centers one should make sure that he has uh, covered the uh, relevant subjects at a good conceptual depth from nptel and and or or from standard books uh, so that uh, he or she can benefit from these got it got it uh so do you have any suggestions for gate aspirants or uh, the aspirants who want to get into analog domain uh yeah some uh, one suggestion would be as i said be, uh, previously as well to maintain consistency because maintaining consistency is the biggest challenge in life and being patient uh, to wait for the end outcome i would just i uh, like to give one small example so whenever we download a big file from google chrome or any other browser we see a progress bar in it that uh, this much mb has been downloaded of the total size this much percent has been downloaded this is the estimated time now uh, one app uh, i would not name the app so there uh, i i i miss this feature a lot when i download a file i don't know how much uh, mb or gb the file is how much has been downloaded and how much time is left now life is like the second thing all when we are do, uh, doing something uh, trying to learn something in my our bachelors we ex the outcome will come sometime later we don't know when the outcome is going to come we don't know how much we have covered to me now these kind of situations makes us restless i feel terribly restless when i see that there is no progress bar in the downloads and i don't know how much time it will going to it will take and this applies in real life as well we don't know where this struggle is going to end and how much more effort i need to put how much i have already put so the, the, uh, we should try to overcome this as much as possible because there is no alternative to hard work that is for sure and hard work if coupled with smart de decision making it will take anybody anywhere for some people it, it might require more hard work some people it might require less but hard work is definitely required so there is no substitute of that so people should understand and try to be more patient uh, that outcomes might not come so you might have experienced in your placement interviews as well you might get rejected by several companies in a row and then one day you get selected but what happens if you get selected rejected by one or two companies then you lose hope nothing so in life we should not take things like that uh, that is one thing and always we should try to keep an open mind and try try to learn new things and uh, because i initially had this resistance so i would tell you if somebody told me 5 years back Uh, in 2018 when i was studying analog circuits that i would become i would want to become analog design engineer one day i would have laughed at the person because that time neither i understood analog nor i had interest in it now <coughs> i developed the interest in my 7th semester of btech now if i had the guy 7th semester of btech is too late for developing an interest i would have lost this opportunity i might not have joined masters also i might have done something else who knows but i because i had that open mind and i uh, that by that time i was in my final year of btech i learned uh, what is what i learned to learn the subject like the subject it helped me a lot so that uh, is something that people should focus uh, ha how to have an open mind and how to learn new things because trust me it is uh, as we grow older and older uh, our uh, friction to learn something new increases more and more because uh, inherently every one of us has, has this feeling that uh, we have learned enough let it be we i will manage with that but more you try to overcome this and learn more new things it will help you grow as an individual do better in your professional life as well amazing amazing i should say your journey is so amazing and all the best for the coming challenges and yeah same to you as well thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all your uh, knowledge and giving us idea about analog design flow digital design flow and the differences and your gate preparation strategies and your experience so far and all the best for the coming challenges in your life Yeah thanks a lot Pranati for hosting me on your channel and uh, allowing me to share my two cents on whatever i have learned so far i uh, i was really glad to share all that and uh, definitely i also wish you all the best for all your upcoming years in the industry uh, so that you can also share your insights and uh, we can learn from each other and from the others in the community as well thank you thank you so much
थैंक यू